Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And my guest today is the founder and chief investment officer at Bison Interests, an investment firm focused on public energy equities. Mr. Josh Young, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Happy to have you here. I really have wanted to really dig into the oil and gas industry. Um, That's something that I've been meaning to do with the channel, but haven't had a big chance to do that. So it's amazing to have you here. Um, I want to get started with the Josh Young origin story. How did you discover investing? What led you to the energy sector and ultimately to founding Bison Interests? Yeah, so... um... I, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. And also none of this is an offer or solicitation or recommendation. So that's, uh, that's my disclaimer. Please do your own diligence, consult an advisor. So, um, I used to read the newspaper every day when I was little and, um, I started with reading the comics and then it got to the point where I would read, uh, cover, uh, front to back covers. Um, and there was a newspaper column called the Motley Fool. And I would read it and I just, I liked how they thought. I liked how they talked about things. And uh, when I I got a little bit of money as a teenager, I started to invest, I think with a Scott trade account or something along those lines, a discount brokerage. And I'd invest in things that they talked about or that other famous investors that I had read about um, were talking about. And uh, when that also, that always sort of stayed as a hobby for me, I kept reading investment books and maintained interest in public markets. And when I had the opportunity after working in private equity to interview with a family office, um, I was, uh, you know, really excited and interested that they actually had jobs in public equity investing, which I didn't really think was a thing after having gone to the University of Chicago and studied economics and sort of being trained in the whole uh, efficient market theory uh, sort of uh, framework. And so I got to go work with them and was able to uh, look at a lot of different things and discovered that I was really interested in oil and gas and really liked the people. And so in 2015, after oil prices crashed, there was this really compelling opportunity to come in and buy individual oil and gas stocks at a discount to where they had been trading and um, at compelling valuations. And so with a partner, we, we started Bison to, to do that as, a, as an investment fund and to own sort of a series of individual oil and gas companies, each with sort of their own uh, dynamics. And the, the theory there was, um, you know, again, oil and gas stocks were down, uh, capital spending was down. The thought was that eventually valuations would sort of catch up, that there would be another up cycle and that there'd be another capital cycle. And that until that up cycle and until that capital cycle kicked in, it would be compelling to remain invested. And so <laughs> we thought it would take three years. And so far it's been you know a lot longer than that. Um, but the, the capital cycle theory is sort of working. And uh, you know, here, here we are years later in uh, 2022. So before we dive into some specifics, I want to bring up a question I've been hearing a lot and that I'm also curious about, and that's the question of peak oil. So from your perspective, is there such a thing as peak oil? And if so, approximately when do you think we would see that occurring? So it's so interesting because there have been different ideas about peak oil and what it means. So behind me is a book, uh, Twilight in the Desert. And so um, that, that was uh, Matt Simmons' theory, or it was about his theory that uh, Saudi Arabia was running out of their oil reserves and that they had grossly overstated those reserves. And it was published, um, I think, in the early 2000s. And sort of as I started to invest professionally in oil and gas stocks, that was a, a topic that was hotly debated and sort of uh, front of mind. Uh, after the shale discovery and development in the U.S., where millions and millions of barrels a day of production came online from a resource that people thought was uneconomic, uh, that debate shifted to the point where in 2020, uh, during the COVID pandemic, during government forced and mandated lockdowns of cities and frankly, whole countries, uh, there was a discussion that maybe we had actually hit, hit peak demand, not peak supply. And so um, that was also not true. And that was a great investment opportunity when people were that uh, despairing of the future of demand for oil, which historically has basically just gone up over time. Um, 
it, it was a very compelling opportunity there, but I think it also showed that we're probably not that close to peak demand as demand has continued to rebound strongly from COVID lows. Um, and we're also probably not near peak supply, given that some of the issues that Matt Simmons uh, talked about have been addressed from an engineering perspective. And so the way I think about it is more of a peak cheap oil rather than peak oil. And as we think about where oil supplies have come from, I think it makes a lot of sense to think about how much demand we're going to see in 10 years or 20 years if current trends hold, and then where supply needs to come from and how expensive that incremental supply likely is going to be. And so I think I think about it more in terms of peak cheap oil rather than peak absolute oil. And eventually, maybe we'll hit a point where... Um, we're, we're maximizing the amount of oil we can get out of the ground, and, and it's hard to tell exactly when that will be or, um, or how much production will be coming out or what the price of oil will be at that point. But that's likely from current trends uh, very far off in the future. And from your perspective as a fund manager, because that's a little different of a perspective than a lot of people I get on the show, and of course we know uh, nothing here is investing advice, but from that perspective, what are you seeing right now in the oil and gas sector that are major tailwinds or major catalysts uh, moving forward? Yeah, so so um, when when you think about the, the oil cycle, similar to other commodity cycles, it starts with a uh, uh, production and uh, consumption of oil starts actually with a exploration prospect. And so you need exploration activity, uh, survey activity and uh, activity to figure out where to drill exploration wells. And then for every 10 exploration wells, there might be three discoveries. And of those, one of them is going to be really compelling as, as shown by delineation wells and delineation activity. And then of those Three, so maybe one of the initial 10 ends up in production in material quantities. And at that point, you end up with substantial production uh, activity ramp up through large development platforms offshore or through a number of wells drilled onshore along with other uh, facilities and infrastructure and so on. And so um, when you think about an oil cycle, what historically has started oil cycles is insufficient supply relative to demand. And what ends oil cycles has historically been uh, a excess of supply relative to demand. And when you look back, it's, it's really amazing seeing the newspapers uh, and the discussions of, oh, well, the world's awash with oil. And then two years later, oh, like uh, we're, where will, we're running out of oil. Where will it be? And, and sort of this cycle that we've seen even the last two years. I mean, this has played out. It played out in the 1920s. It played out in the 60s and 70s. It played out in the early 2000s. I mean, this has happened many, many times. So I think, I think it's helpful to think about things from that sort of uh, perspective. And it's really interesting because I think right now there aren't that many people arguing still credibly that we're, we're at peak demand. Um, they might argue that we're, we're experiencing an economic downturn that might temporarily affect demand, but I, I don't see many people really making credible peak demand arguments. And from the perspective of looking at these individual companies and looking at the services companies and seeing how eviscerated that whole exploration to development cycle has been where almost all the capital spent right now is on development. But again, if you don't have the exploration and delineation, you run out of stuff to develop. And even on the development side, there's been underinvestment in equipment and there's insufficient labor. So when you think about all that, it looks pretty compelling in terms of the prospects for the industry to shift eventually towards a capital cycle where a lot of money is spent and then understanding how long it takes to go from exploration to full-scale production. Onshore, it might be a few years. Offshore, in some cases, it's 10 years. And so that gives you a visibility into sort of how long this bull market can go. And then from a valuation perspective, and again, not investment advice, but just to frame the understanding of, of what's going on, you have this uh, remarkable uh, divergence in valuations, which historically you've mostly just seen during the bottom periods of, uh, of commodity markets where the large caps and mid caps are trading at, let's say, five to seven times EBITDA, um, which is, is not bad. I mean, it's a lot cheaper than some of the tech companies, but it's a pretty healthy valuation. And the smaller cap producers in many cases are trading at two or three times EBITDA. And so that's a real problem because you kind of need the smaller caps to actually trade at a premium 
to provide them with equity capital for the markets to be rewarding them to go do the exploration activity that's historically taken place by smaller companies and similar to junior miners and other sorts of commodity uh, sectors, you really need the small, nimble entrepreneurial companies to be out there engaging in that sort of activity. So there's a really weird, unusual setup. And I think it just tells you that we're at the early stages of this commodity uh, bull market, particularly this uh, oil bull market. And, and again, it's, I think, helpful to look at it from a company by company basis to get that sort of color that you might miss if you just look at it holistically uh, without understanding the companies as well as the capital markets and how they're interplaying with the supply and demand cycle. I will be co-hosting the Kinvestor Battery Metals and Mining Conference on November 22nd at 9 a.m. Pacific Time alongside Gwen Preston of The Resource Maven. We've got some great companies who are going to be presenting and answering your questions live, including ISO Energy, Suma Silver, Sigma Lithium, and more. So click the link in the description below this video to reserve your spot now, and I'll see you guys November 22nd at the Kinvestor Battery Metals and Mining Conference. So what are you seeing out there in terms of sentiment? Because at the moment, a lot of politicians are vilifying fossil fuels, saying we've got to end oil, we've got to end hydrocarbons. Um, it seems like they're living in a fantasy world, but do you think reality will eventually set in? Are you seeing any of that? Or uh, what, what, what's your take on the current sentiment? And do you think we will eventually see a pendulum swing politically to, to the other side of the equation when people realize we really do need fossil fuels to have a truly energy efficient uh, economy? Yeah, I think, I think these are great questions. I think um, the current administration in the US in particular is very odd because they're both uh, demanding that fossil fuel companies stop <laughs> their development activities and like go away or don't frack anymore or what have you, and that uh, they're being accused of market manipulation and price gouging and being told to produce more. And so it's sort of one of these things where it's clear that they're just hated and whatever the problem is, they're going to be blamed for it. And so you know, that's, I think, reflected to some extent in the low valuations of the small producers who are dependent upon to go engage in exploration and to help discover the next big oil fields and to discover the supply that we're going to need in a year and five years and 10 years and so on. And so, yeah, I think eventually it seems likely that the political pendulum swings the other way. And this this sort of resolves. I've I've talked about this a little bit as like a pain trade, where you know you buy one of these small producers at two times EBITDA, and either their valuation multiple is going way higher in order for the market to tell that producer to go start growing, to start exploring, and so on, or the price of oil is going way higher because none of them do. All of them go and buy back shares and pay off debt and pay dividends because or buy other small fields because. Why would they ever go drill? I mean, if you're at two times EBITDA, you should, and you have uh, low decline production and plenty of inventory, you should be retiring your shares. If you have a lot of free cash flow, you should not be going and drilling a lot, uh, generally speaking. And so, you know, I think the market responds to politicians' messages and to regulations. And if the market's responding to these things, then you're going to end up in a situation where you have much higher prices, and maybe that's what the maybe that's what the politicians want. Um, but I like it because it's sort of it's this like ratchet. You end up with either your oil price goes up a lot, or your valuation multiple goes up a lot. And either way, as an owner of one of these businesses, in theory, you end up making a lot of money, and it doesn't get resolved because oil production declines naturally, this whole problem doesn't get resolved through regulation. It gets resolved through entrepreneurial investment and activity. And if that isn't happening, I mean, it's not happening right now. It, it, it's, it, the amount is grossly insufficient relative to what's necessary to be able to adequately supply the world. To the extent that continues, it just means that price ends up a lot higher. And that, uh, you know, that's not so bad. It's terrible for the world economy. Uh, it's terrible for the poorest people in the world, but it's frankly great for the investors in oil and gas businesses. So there's a lot of publicly traded companies around the world in the oil and gas sector. It can be a little overwhelming for someone like myself who's used to uranium and there's only like a handful of investable companies there. So um, 
there's a lot of like subsectors within it. There's the explorers, developers, and producers, like with a lot of other commodities. But there's also a very large service component to the sector involving oil field services, pipelines, etc. So can you break down what different sectors are available to invest in within the overall oil and gas space and, and maybe provide some color there? Sure. So I think one thing that's interesting about oil and one thing why it was just so off base for politicians and market commentators and so on to, to say that oil was going away, oil is a huge part of the global economy. I think in the U.S. right now, earnings of oil and gas producers and related companies are over 10% of the overall earnings, while the market cap is 5 or 5.5%. Five so there's a divergence in terms of market cap, and that was even lower before. But there's also, um, I mean, when you think about how big that is relative to other sectors and other sorts of things that you might invest in or interact with on a daily basis, I mean, it's, it's a very big part of the total profits, the total earnings generated in the overall economy, which is, you know, the largest, I think the U.S. is the largest economy in the world. So a big part of that is oil and gas. So it's not it's not uranium. It's not some other commodities which are, are much, much smaller. Oil is huge. Um, you know, when you think about oil at almost $100 a barrel and, um, you know, 100 million barrels a day of production and consumption. And then the uplift right now, I mean, refining margins are pretty high. You're looking at roughly $150 a barrel on consumption uh, when you look at the refined products, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. But that's that's an enormous amount of economic activity. So it's not like uh, various politicians say, oh, well, these guys are selling it for 150 and really they should sell it for 50 because that's their break even or whatever. The reality is that there's many different companies, like you're saying, that are involved in different aspects. So the one that I think people focus on most is the upstream producers. So the companies that own the wells, that own the production and the rights to the, the oil or natural gas or NGLs that are coming out from wells. Um, there's, there's a few other sort of uh, sectors. So those companies fund drilling. They um, are responsible for uh, all the costs associated with it. And if wells blow up or whatever, they share the responsibility with services contractors. They're, they own the production, but also have liabilities associated with environmental and other issues like um, re removing well sites and cleaning up the ground and doing all that other sort of remediation uh, after after wells are done producing. Um, so there that's sort of one aspect and that's probably the biggest aspect by quite a bit. Um, the the next is the services companies, which in some cases will own drilling rigs and provide the crews for the drilling rigs to the producers, to the ENPs, um, and similar sort of equipment. So they might own offshore rigs, they might own pressure pumping, they might offer uh, workover rigs or many, many different sorts of services that are involved in either the uh, drilling of a well and all the sort of related activities or the production from a well, any sort of chemicals and processing and so on that's necessary. Um, and then uh, and then also if there's a problem with the well, they might come in. If there's a fire, they might come and help uh, put out the fire. Or if the well dies, they might come in and help uh, resuscitate it or that sort of uh, environmental uh, remediation or abandonment of wells. Th those are also done by services companies. Um, there are also midstream companies that will own um, processing in some cases. Uh, so if you're getting oil out of the ground, typically you're getting water and oil and natural gas and natural gas liquids and sort of various other things. You might be getting some sand, you might be getting some other uh, sort of heavier um, elements. And so there's a whole sort of separation process and then there's uh, further uh, sort of purification processes and compression and so on. And so in some cases, the producers own that. And in some cases, third party midstream companies own that sort of gathering and processing. And then uh, wells, especially in sort of in prolific fields, they're typically connected via uh, gathering systems to processing and compression facilities that then put oil or natural gas into larger pipelines that bring it to refineries or to, um, you know, like the Houston Ship Channel where it's put in a, 
um, in a silo and then onto a boat or, or t- for transport or something else like that. So, um, and, and then uh, another big thing that midstream companies do is they own very large pipelines. So there is various interstate and even pipelines that run between the U.S. and Mexico or the U.S. and Canada. And so there are various midstream companies that own those and charge typically a regulated uh, fee. It's almost like a utility uh, for oil companies or marketers to um to move the oil from one place to another. Um, so then there's marketers. So then sometimes owned by midstream companies, sometimes by ENPs, and sometimes they're independent companies. And those um, will you know, buy and sell oil in different places. They'll take risk on shipping oil through a pipeline or buy it in one place and rent out a boat and ship it to another place. Um, they'll help make markets. So they'll guarantee prices for producers, typically at a discount to the price that you see on your screen. Um, so, so that's a whole, uh, set of companies as well as, uh, offering within, uh, certain ENPs within certain midstream companies. And then there are tanker companies and other sorts of logistics, non-marketing companies that own, uh, VLCCs and other sorts of oil tankers that bring oil from point A to point B or other similar sorts of tankers like LNG tankers bringing natural gas from the US to Europe or Asia or other sorts of refined products tankers as well. And then there are oil majors who own some or all of those things as well. Typically, they don't own tankers and typically they don't provide oil field services because of liability, but otherwise they'll they'll do a lot of those other things. So I don't know if that was too much or confusing, but you know there's just lots of these different activities. Um, there was also chemical companies and other sorts of suppliers. There's really, there's a whole, um, I guess it's not that surprising when you think about it being 10 or 15% of the gross domestic product of a country. Um, you know, there's really a lot of different um, businesses within it and a lot of different uh, offerings by each of those sorts of businesses. It's, it's not just you go poke a hole in the ground and then the oil pops out and it's, uh, oh, and then obviously there's also, sorry, I left out refining, right? There's just so, so many things. So obviously refining in some cases owned by oil majors in some cases independent and refineries take your oil uh, and turn it into the oil companies oil and they turn it into gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and various other uh products that are used for chemicals and all kinds of other things. So, um, you know, just many different aspects of the business. I happen to focus on the upstream, partly because that's where um, most of the market cap and value is held, as well as, frankly, it's sort of the easiest to understand. Um, And then occasionally we'll find services businesses, midstream businesses or so on that I find particularly compelling through my research and understanding of the, the MP companies. Oh, that was a very thorough breakdown. It's never too much on this show. We want all the information. So that was amazing. Um, so when it comes to analyzing individual securities within the oil and gas space, um, could you maybe give us some insight into the main things you're looking for and maybe also highlight any red flags that you come across that that might make you turn away from a potential investment? Sure. So um, the the really sort of simple way to explain what we're doing and what we're looking for is um, is uh, good assets, great management teams, and survivable, survivable balance sheets, and then all of that at a uh, compelling valuation. And so realistically, you almost never get all of that. And so it's always a question of give and take a little bit in terms of, you know, how good are these assets? How cheap is the stock? How good is the management team? How strong is the balance sheet? You know, what's the what's the strategy of the business? How likely is it to be successful, and so on? And those are those are deep questions that require a lot of work. And I don't think anyone's the best at it. I think it's just, and you're never perfect at it. You're constantly working and trying to improve, and listening to other people that do it, and research analysts at investment banks, and very. I mean, there's just it's a it's a very complicated problem that is uh, hard to perfect. Um, so. I guess um, one way to like one one thing I think that people these days are really getting caught up on is well maybe two things so one is trading liquidity and so there's been this huge bubble in large cap stocks over the last roughly decade or so and it's most similar to the 1960s Nifty Fifty era where there were 50 companies that ended up representing an enormous percentage of the overall market capitalization of the broader 
stock market, even though they didn't represent nearly as much of the earnings of the overall stock market. So that was a time where Warren, Warren Buffett and other value investors did extraordinarily well because they could go buy great companies at two or three times EBITDA. I don't know if that sounds familiar. So um, we've experienced that similarly where up until recently, the argument was, hey, this sounds nice, right? Maybe you're good at finding value stocks, but why would I own anything other than Facebook or Apple or Amazon or what have you? And so, you know, these companies, relatively few companies ended up representing a very large percentage of the overall stock market in the U.S. And there was a similar phenomenon internationally. And so I think, uh, I think we're sort of in this world where there's still this strong preference for size and liquidity. And so um, it's, it's frustrating and amazing to be able to buy Let's say, let's look at Oxy, right? I don't own Occidental Petroleum, but you know, it's not it's not a bad company. Uh, Warren Buffett owns a lot of it. People have looked at it really closely, especially since Buffett started to buy it. And when you look at Oxy, they have a, a set of assets and a set of different businesses they're involved in. And um, when you look at the valuation of their overall company, you can see that you can basically buy uh, smaller businesses that own either the same or very similar assets for a fraction of the valuation of the overall business of Oxy. And, and sure, there's like reasons why people buy the stock anyway. There's reasons why Warren Buffett is buying that stock still, um, even though it's at that higher valuation. But when you listen to Warren Buffett talk about investing and what he would do if he was managing $50 million, and I don't think he's inflation adjusting it, so maybe it's if he was managing $100 million or but not $100 billion or whatever, right? I mean, I think that's around Berkshire's cash position right now. So... Um, when you listen carefully, he talks about how he would generate 50% compounded returns if he was still investing $50 million instead of, you know, he expects Berkshire to achieve way lower returns. And the reason for that is that there's such a size discrepancy in terms of valuation. So the wonderful thing is likely if you're listening to this, you're probably not Warren Buffett and <laughs> you're probably not running Berkshire and so, or, or an entity of a similar size. And so it's, it's, it's good news. It's wonderful news. And one of the things I think I've struggled the most with communicating is that because of this wonderful news that, you know, again, it's not like Buffett argues with this. He actually encourages this. Uh, you know, he says, if you don't know what you're doing, you should put money in an index fund. But if you know what you're doing, you know, he kind of encourages doing what he did, which was to go find really cheap stocks and to research them thoroughly and to buy them. So really, I think the biggest single thing and, you know, I, I said there were a couple of things, but really the biggest single thing is being able to find these sort of two times or three times EBITDA companies versus the six or seven times and being able to research them enough that we understand that we're not going to lose all our money in this company because they're you know about to go bankrupt or that you know we're buying a small company and it, it's not at five times EBITDA or six times or it's not running out of its drilling inventory or having terrible results and its management team owns some stock instead of doesn't owning stock or like not owning stock sorry um, and so you know I think I think these sort of basic criteria can help keep people out of trouble and you know I think Again, it's not, there's nothing that's perfect, but it's helpful, I think, to think about, okay, oil probably does well because of this long-term underinvestment. Buffett gets that, so he can't go buy or chooses not to buy 50 stocks of small producers. He goes and buys Oxy at that higher valuation. And I look at Oxy and similar businesses and say, okay, I can find this but a lot smaller and maybe better in some ways, right? Maybe a better team that's more focused on a particular asset and they're really, really good at it. And, you know, maybe they're better than the equivalent people at a big company managing that size or a similar sort of asset. Um, or maybe it's a lower decline or less capital intensive or so on. And so I think, uh, I think when you think about things from a valuation perspective, it really helps in terms of having that sort of clarity and then understanding where we're at in this big to small cycle where I think that sort of small to big already played out. I think we've sort of, it seems like we've hit peak FANGUM or whatever that acronym, uh, it's, it's gotten sort of changed a few different ways and different companies have been in it or out of it. But many of those businesses, many of those stocks are down considerably. And at the same time, smaller cap stocks have been doing okay. And I think there's room for that sort of small company that's undervalued to get a lot more attention now and to have a lot better chance for it to get bid up at the same time as oil and gas 
has the same sort of tailwind. And so, um, you know, I think differentiating among small caps, uh, small caps require a lot more work. Um, and I think there's really just this opportunity to win on finding good small caps and winning from small caps in oil and gas, likely re-rating along with small caps in general, potentially re-rating versus the broader market. So let's talk about jurisdiction a little bit. Um, in your opinion, are there any areas of the world that are better uh, in terms of, of oil and gas? And obviously, that's a really broad question. And, you know, balancing risk in different areas, because uh, coming from a uranium perspective, you know, in Canada, we have the Athabasca Basin, the Saudi Arabia of uranium. It's amazing, amazing grades of uranium. But the permitting is insane. The ESG red tape is insane. They have to do all these deals with the indigenous people in the area. That's not a bad thing. It's just a requirement of that area. And then you have a place, for example, like Niger in Africa, where you can get a mine permitted much more quickly, still has quite a rich history of uranium mining there, or Rano's been there for 50 years or whatever. But people get worried because, you know, people get kidnapped there. There's political turmoil. There's terrorism. Um, so when it comes to oil, how do you look at and balance jurisdictional risk? And are there any jurisdictions you just say, no, I'm just going to avoid that area because it's too risky? You know, I think it's a great question and it's been evolving for me a little bit over time. Um, I'd say, so when we started Bison in 2015, we were really just focused on the U.S. and Canada onshore and just producers. And so we've shifted a little. We have some more services exposure as services stocks have lagged versus uh, producers and as they're starting to uh, earn great margins and their revenue and, and margins are, are growing rapidly. Um, so similarly, from a geographic perspective, um, we have a little bit of international exposure beyond the U.S. and Canada. And it's something where in any individual non um, non-American, non-Canadian jurisdiction, uh, we, we limit our exposure to not um, not be too hurt if there's any particular change. Um, but, but there are, I mean, th there's a lot of risk in the U.S. and Canada right now, unfortunately. And it's, it's sort of bullish for oil and bullish for natural gas from a price perspective, but it's potentially bearish from a company perspective. And it's actually, it's, it's one of the things that makes me so focused on valuation because it used to be that if you were in Canada, let's say you'd get a seven times EBITDA multiple and you know, you'd be plus or minus one times on that. And depending on exactly what oil or gas price you're underwriting to, but let's just say directionally that. And if you were in Colombia, let's say you'd get a two times EBITDA multiple. And it's no longer that obvious that the anti oil and gas president of Colombia is that much worse than the anti-oil and gas prime minister of Canada. And actually, you know, we don't have a ton of exposure there in particular, but you know, there's a few juris different jurisdictions that we've added to exposure to in the last couple of years. And you know, I, think, I think the way you described it is reasonable, right? Like there are real issues with getting uh, production online in the US and Canada, very unfortunately. I mean, the environmental standards are very high to the extent that they actually meant to just have uh, the environment protected, uh, there would be an encouragement of production of oil and gas in Canada and the US because it's so clean, because the standards are so high, especially relative to the places, ironically, we import oil from to Canada, to California and so on. It's really, I mean, it's like deeply cynical and ironic. Um, so. I think I think it's just it's it's a hard question. I think it requires uh, some balancing, and I think the way that we we navigate it is just through um, having exposure in various countries, but making sure that that exposure in any individual company in sorry in any individual country is uh, limited. Okay, and a bit of a follow up to that. Do you think America as a jurisdiction is a little bit? safer politically than Canada simply because the different states often set their own rules. So you have places like Texas and Wyoming that are very friendly to the extractive industries. Does that provide a bit of an advantage as opposed to a place like Canada where the federal government can just come in and, and create all these rules immediately? So um, as I understand it, um, actually the Canadian provinces are more insulated than U.S. states in terms of uh, federal regulation. So uh, the, the difference is that Alberta is not on the coast, whereas Texas is on the coast. And so Texas and because of Texas and Louisiana, uh, US producers in many jurisdictions are beneficiaries 
um, and are able to have access to tide water where they're able to get uh, oil or natural gas out. Um, Canada does not have that. They have not honored their agreement, or the interprovincial agreement, which the, by which uh, Albertan production has a sort of constitutional right to, to leave. So um, they haven't honored that, unfortunately, but there are consequences for them not honoring that. And it's not a permanent situation from what I can tell. And so one of the ways you can tell that is even with a radical left-wing government, which is a, you know, a coalition of, um, you, you can tell he's left-wing because there's a bunch of pictures of him in blackface, um, along with, uh, he's in a coalition with the far left political party, right? So, you know, you know, they're, <laughs> they're far to the left when, when that's apparently fine, uh, or something. Um, and I'm not condoning that by the way, or, or endorsing any political party in, in any jurisdiction. Um, but, uh, you know, even with that, they're still building West Coast LNG in Canada. They're still expanding the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, you know, differentials, they're a little wide right now, but they've been relatively um, reasonable over the last couple of years. And the trajectory seems to be towards reasonable um, reasonable levels of, uh, of discounts there. And so, you know, I think it's actually a pretty stable jurisdiction. And if anything... I'm a little more optimistic about things getting better there than getting better in the U.S. Again, low bar and things were really bad, um, but it does think, seem like things are sort of on the upswing for, for Canada, for the oil and gas industry. Um, and then they're also helped. Um, the economic policies in Canada are so abysmal that the Canadian dollar has gotten destroyed. And a lot of the Canadian economy is supported by Canadian housing, which if you think there's a bubble in the U.S., Canadian housing is way worse. And so Canada is in this really interesting situation where their dollar is already partially devalued and where it seems likely to devalue further. And so as the producer of commodities that are dollar denominated, even though they're discounted because of pipeline access and other sorts of bad policies, um, there's actually a pretty big advantage economically of being in a country like Canada, where a lot of the costs are, um, a lot of the costs are local, the job market, it's not entirely local, but it's, uh, you know, predominantly local. And so if you have Canadian dollar costs, to some extent, and US dollar denominated product, to some extent, things in Canada actually look quite promising. So, you know, I'm, you can tell I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. You know, we're not exclusively in Canada, but we do have a number of investments there. And I'm quite optimistic, both about, uh, you know, the rules and, and regulatory environment there getting more favorable for oil and gas and for the economic prospects due, unfortunately, to the results of uh, bad economic policy there. So outside of the oil and gas sector, is there any other commodity out there that you see an opportunity in at the moment? There are a number. Or commodities. Um, you, you, can, you can name more than one. Yeah, there are a number, but I think it's better to, I think, I think really, I, I debate this with friends who are really excited about, let's say, uranium or really excited about various other commodities. And I understand the theses, but from my perspective, getting to own oil and gas producer equities at two or three times EBITDA is not comparable to basically any opportunity I see anywhere else in the market. And so um, I can think that X, Y, or Z commodity might be promising or not from a supply and demand perspective. I can think that you know maybe like uranium, for example, probably should be a lot higher, but it still doesn't compare to the opportunity among producing uh, oil and gas companies or to some of the services companies trading at pennies on the dollar versus replacement cost. It's just so, so compelling that it's really hard to say, okay, yeah, I like this and I'll also go and buy a uranium miner or copper miner or so on. So yeah, I think that the setup for commodities in general is very promising. I think the setup for oil and gas is overwhelming and um, you know, the opportunity to own great businesses run by good people at these sorts of valuations. I mean, it's just, it's still historic. The stocks are up a lot, but they're up a lot off generational lows and they're still very mispriced, especially on the small cap side um, versus many metrics, you know, versus historical transactions versus where mid and large caps are trading right now. 
um, versus free cash flow versus replacement cost. I mean, there's many ways to see, you know, versus the likely discounted cash flow just blowing down the production from their assets. There's a number of different ways to see that these things are really compelling. And so, you know, I'm an expert in it and <laughs> they're really compelling. So it's really hard to, and I'm sorry for, for uh, pu pushing back on that a little, but, um, you know, just so, so compelling, it's hard, hard to look elsewhere. No, I love that. Your answer to other commodities was oil and gas still. And I, I, I like that a lot. You've got me more bullish than ever. Um, so much wisdom shared. I gained so much insight from this conversation. I think the people watching will too. Uh, for those who want to hear more from you, learn more about buys and interests, um, where's the best place to, to go online? Uh, the best place is uh, bisoninterest.com. And to sign up, we have a roughly monthly newsletter that we put out uh, covering, uh, usually it's oil macro. Occasionally we'll talk about individual investments that we've made or other observations in the oil and gas market. And uh, that's the best place. And then also uh, on Twitter, there's a bison interest handle sharing that research and some other observations. And then um, I'm on Twitter as well. You can find me just searching my name. Okay, great. I'll put a link in all that to the description in the description below. Great to have you on and, and hope to do this again sometime. Great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. This is the Uranium Element Cube from Engineered Labs. They're a sponsor of the program now. And the reason why is because I genuinely love this product. I've always wanted to get real uranium in my hands, and that's what this is. That crystal in there is 50% uranium by weight. The acrylic shield surrounding it reduces the radiation emitted to a very low level that is completely safe. Uh, Engineered Labs also ships worldwide, which is great. The products are made in the USA, and if you use my discount code COMMODITIES at checkout, you'll receive a 10% discount on your order and you will be supporting this program. The Uranium Element Cube, link is in the description below. And now, back to the program. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.